My name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2019. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today is our lesson number four. Day Day four, and we are on page number 149. Make sure, make sure the book is in front of you. Turn to page number 149. The very first problem that you see there on page 149 is where we're going to pick up from. Problem number 25. Or rather, I was wrong. No, not the very first problem. The last two problems that are left. We did the, we did 20 through 24 yesterday. We're going to pick up from 25. The last two problem on that page. The penultimate, the penultimate problem from the penultimate problem on the page. It says, it says the 60%, 60% of the people that we send questionnaire to, they're going to send out some questionnaire, some sort of a survey form, uh, they're going to send them out and from their past experience they know that only 60% of people will bother to send the questionnaire back, to send the survey back. Only 60%, only 60% will, will respond. That we know from experience. We need, we need 300 responses. Question simply is, question simply is, how many questionnaires How many questionnaires should be sent out? Should be sent. Should be mailed. So it's very straightforward. We want 300 of them back, which means that 300 that we need back, that represents 60%. So the question simply is 60%. The question simply is 300 is 60%. 300 is 60%. Of what? That's the straightforward question. We want to find out what number is it that we take a 60% of it and we get 300. So let's do it. 300 is means equal. 60% means over 100. Out of 100. Off means times. And here is the unknown. Let's isolate the x. Multiply both sides by 100 and divide by 60. So we get x equals to 300. 300 times 100 over 60. Divide top and bottom by 10, and then divide top and bottom by 6. 5 times 100, the answer is 500. Of course, the answer is 500 because it makes sense. Because of 10%, 10% of 500 is 50. 10% is 500 is 650. Therefore, 40% is going to be 200. You subtract 200 from it, you're left with 60%. That's to 26. So the answer here is D. Number 26. In number 26, we are told that we're going to buy, uh, we bought, this merchant rather, he bought some eggs for $2.80 for a dozen. That's what he paid for them. He's going to turn around, the merchant is going to turn around and sell these eggs, sell for $0.90 cents for three. He's going to turn around and sell Three for ninety cents. Question simply is, what's his profit? What's his profit on five dozen? He's going to sell five dozen eggs. Oh, I didn't erase that word. I don't know, but we'll learn it in a second. What I said is that we're going to pick up today from the penultimate question on page number 149. Penultimate is just a very fancy way of saying second to the last problem. Number 25 is where we picked up from, which happened to be the second last question on the page. The penultimate question. So, what do we do here? Well, it's $2.80 per dozen is what he bought for, and he's going to sell five of them. So let's find out, let's first find out his cost. His cost is $2.80 for one dozen. For one dozen, which means if you multiply ten times both sides here, 
which means that he must pay he, the price that he has to pay is 280 times 10 which is 28 dollars for 10 dozens but he doesn't sell 10 dozen he only sells 5 dozen so just take half of it so 5 dozens for 14 dollars 14 dollars for 5 dozens that's what he paid for them let's see let's see what his revenue is by selling at the rate of 90 cents for three of them first thing you have to figure out is five dozen five dozen is simply five times twelve which is sixty he's going to tell sixty of them so let's begin the story so he sells three three for ninety cents three for ninety cents which implies that he must sell six for one hundred and eighty cents twice the amount he doesn't want to sell he doesn't want to sell six he doesn't want to sell six eggs he wants to sell sixty of them but if he wants to sell sixty take ten times the amount 60 for not 180 cents but 180 times 10 180 times 10 is 1800 cents which is 18 dollars so he sells for 18 dollars but he costs it cost him only 14 dollars so he makes a profit he makes a profit of four dollars he makes a profit of four dollars the answer is c answer is c let's go to the next page shall we on the following page number 27 On number 27 on the next page, it says that we have rather 27, not 24. On number 27, it says that we have 24 cards numbered 1 through 24. One card is picked at random. One card is picked at random and if you were to do that and I'm not, I'm not going to put everything on the blackboard I'm just going to read the, and you, of course you have the book in front of you it's important that you have the book in front of you read it yourself the question simply is if you did have 24 cards each one of them was number 1 through 24 no, no cards no two cards are numbered the same each one has a unique number 1 through 24 then if I were to pick one card at random what are the odds that the card that I pick happens to be what are the odds? What's the probability that the card that I pick happens to be the number on the card rather, not the card itself obviously, the number on the card happens to be divisible by 2 and 3. 2 and 3 or it happens to be divisible by 7. Let's take a look at it. The number on the card, what are the odds that the card that we pick is divisible by both 2 and 3. Not 2 or 3, it doesn't say or, it says and. 2 and 3. Well, if a number is divisible by both 2 and 3, a number that is divisible by both 2 and 3 is a number that is divisible by 6. In order for something to be divisible by both 2 and 3, it has to be an even number, an even number such that it is divisible by, it has to be an even number because it has to be divisible by 2, and um, uh, 2 and 3 it has to be divisible by 3, which means it has to be a multiple of 6. So how many how many numbers did we find that are multiple of 6 from 1 to 24? Let's find out, shall we? Obviously 6, 6, 12, 18, and 24, only 4 of them. Only 4 of them. So that takes care of this part. And how many numbers are going to be divisible by 7 between 1 through 24. We have 7, we have 14 and 21. That's all. So we have 3 cards here, 4 cards there, and either one of these two categories will do because or. We want to pick a card that is either a multiple of 6 or a multiple of 7. Saying that they are divisible, saying that the number on the card is divisible by 7 or uh, divisible by 7 is the same as saying that it's a multiple of 7. 14 is a multiple of 7, 21 is a multiple of 7, so on and so forth. So that's it. There are 4 Four, four such cards in this category, three such cards in that category, so it's 7 out of 24. The answer is 7 out of 24. The answer is C. The answer is C. Let's move on. Number 28. In number 28, we are told that a circumference of a circle inscribed 
in a square is 25 pi is 25 pi the question simply is what is the parameter of that square well that's fine now shall we just I keep going there I'm going to keep erasing it as we already said penultimate just a very fancy way of saying second to the last second last penultimate question penultimate person whatever you like do you understand if you're interested in improving your vocabulary and I see no reason why you wouldn't want to improve your vocabulary why would you, why you wouldn't be interested on my channel you will find vocabulary videos just type in GMAT vocabulary words GMAT vocabulary words and this word, this particular word, we learned on day number 11. The video will pop right up, GMAT vocabulary words, day 11. Watch this video and learn the word. You will learn that word along with some other interesting good words to know for GMAT. What was I going to do here? Oh, let's, let's, let's draw this thing. So we have a square. We have a square and inside that square a circle is inscribed. A circle is inscribed simply means the circle touches these four sides at just one point. It is tangent to it. So let's draw such a circle which is tangent to this. There we go. And we are told that the circumference of this circle is 25 pi. How do you find circumference? The circumference is simply 2 pi r. 2 pi r, which is same as which is same as 2 times r times pi. And 2 times r, 2r, r is the radius, 2 times the radius would be the diameter. Diameter is times the pi. Diameter would be this distance right here. Or that distance right here if you like. This is this is r and this is r, so 2r is the diameter. And in other words, this diameter that we see here, which is the two radii, is simply the side of the side of the square. Let's see what we can do with it. And we are told. We are told that this quantity, the circumference, which is pi times which is which is pi times the diameter, is equal to 25 pi. We are told that here, 25 pi, right there. Which means we can divide both sides by pi. And if we're going to divide both sides by pi, we have to get rid of this part now. Divide both sides by pi. What it tells us is that the diameter of this circle. What this tells us is that the diameter of this circle is 25. Diameter of this circle is 25. But the diameter of the circle is the side of the square. Is the side of the square. Therefore the perimeter, therefore the perimeter is simply 4 times 25. 4 times 25 obviously 100. The answer is E. Let's go to 29, shall we? What does 29 have to say? Ah, 29. 29 says if one is less than x, which in turn is less than y, which in turn is less than z. Which of the following has the greatest value? Which of the following has the greatest value? Here are the answer choices A, B, C, D, and E. We are given z times x plus 1, z times y plus 1, x times y plus z, y times x plus z, and finally z times x plus y. Look, this is a simple straightforward question. This is a simple straightforward question. You can just plug in numbers and figure out which one is the greatest quantity here. For example, it tells you that 1 is less than 2, which in turn is less than y, so you, uh, we can just simply plug in 2, 3, and 4. As you can see, 1 is less than 2, and 2 is in, in turn is less than 3, and so on and so forth. And we can work it out and do it out. You can do that if you wanted to, or you can just think about it a little bit. Let's think about it a little bit. It's not that bad. Let's just think about it. The answers are all written in terms of x, y, and z's. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start with the highest possible value that you can come up, that we can come up with, when it's written in terms of x, y, or z. The highest possible value would be this one. The highest possible value here would be the z, because that's the biggest one, times z plus z. 
Because you see we have the, some, some, some quantity outside and then two inside. But that's just two times well, z times two z. It's not here. The next possible, the next next highest value would be to take the highest one z and add the smaller one, which is y. If you see that here, it, that would be the answer. Z times z plus y is not here either. Let's move on. The next one would be z times we did z. We can continue with z, but instead of since y is not here, let's add x. Do you see that here? I don't see it. Z times Z plus X is not there. So let's move on. The next possibility would be to Z times, since when we start with Z, it doesn't work. Let's start with Y. So when we start with Y, is either Y plus Z, Z times Y plus Z, which is already here, Y plus Z times Z. So we're not going to put it here, because Y plus Z is same as Z plus Y. Or other possibility is X plus Y. You see? Y plus Z or Y plus X is this here. Z times Y plus X. There you go. Z times, Z times, Z times X plus Y. There you go. So these answers are written in order from the greatest to the, to the smallest in here. And among these four, we have to keep on going until we find this, this is going to work. The answer is E. But like I said, you can plug in numbers if you want it to, if you find it comfortable with it. If you find, if you find working with numbers more comfortable, more reassuring, then by all means do that. Or we can just analyze it in the abstract way, just like we just did. Number 30. Number 30 says that we have set X that has eight, eight consecutive integers. Consecutive integers. So, so let's make such a set. Set X. Let's just make such a set. 8 consecutive integers, let's just say 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 7 and 8. And then we have set Y, where it says add 4, add 4 to each element of set x and and they say and subtract four subtract four from each each element of set x and that's our set y so let's just make up set y set y is going to be the so first first we have to add four to each of these elements so let's do that if we start adding 4 to it, 1 plus 4 is 5, so story is going to begin at 5, 6, 7, on and on and on. We add 4 to 7, we get 11 and 12. But we are not done. That's the, I was about to close the thing, but we are not done here. That's just half the story. Then we have to subtract 4. So let's subtract 4. If we subtract 4, we're going to get negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, so on and so forth. By the time we subtract 4 from 7, we get 3 and what we notice here, what we notice here is that there is no overlap. We not in the set we cannot double count something. A, an element cannot appear cannot appear uh, more than once. Do you understand? An element cannot appear more than once. For example, uh, if you tell me to make a set of all the people who are coming to dinner, uh, and 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 all the people who are coming for lunch, one set where all the people are going to come into dinner and all the people and all the people are coming to lunch somebody who comes for both of those uh, meals cannot appear twice in the set an element cannot appear twice so that's the only thing we have to be careful about careful here that nothing appears twice and it doesn't because this one starts from negative three and goes all the way up to four and that starts from five and goes up to two there is no there is no double counting here so the how many question is question is how many how many elements does set y have? How many elements set y have? Well, set x has 8 of them. This one has 8 here and 8 here. The answer is 16. The answer is 16. And 6, 16 is, what number was this question? This was number 30. And the 16 is answer choice E. 16 is answer choice E. I should, uh, I should have done this part that I'm about to do now ahead of time, but I didn't, and I'm not going to leave the blackboard right now, so I'm going to use 
this marker is about to die. And if you did this work that I just did here, you would be in the same boat as I was. If that's how you looked at it, you'll be in the same boat as I was. That answer is wrong. That answer is wrong because when I was doing it, I did not read the question carefully. I did not read the question carefully. I was too cavalier, too cocky, and I was just reading it uh, cursorily. I was reading it cursorily and I missed it. What it. The problem does not say, the question does not say how many elements does set Y have. The question says how many, how many, I left, I left out one word. I wasn't paying attention so I, I inadvertently left out one word in my mind. It's, the question does not say how many elements does set Y have. It says how many, how many more elements does set Y have compared to X. Set Y has 16 elements. Set X we saw has eight elements. How many more elements does set X set Y have? The answer to that question is eight. Set Y has eight more elements than does set X. Because set Y has 16 elements as opposed to set X which only has eight elements. So how many more does Y have? Y has eight more than X. Correct answer is not E. Correct answer is eight. Which is answer choice. Which is answer choice C. What's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is that pay attention. Pay attention to details. Pay attention to the wording. Because one word can make a difference. After having done all the work that I did there, I still got it wrong. Because like I said, I was being cavalier. I was being careless. I was being cocky. And I read the question quite cursorily. I read the question quite cursorily. It says, how many more integers are there in set Y? Not how many integers are there in set Y. The problem doesn't say how many integers are there in set Y, it says how many more integers are in set Y compared to set X. Answer is 8. Before we, this, this is where we're going to stop, but before we close the video, let's learn this, this second word here, cursory. But the problem is that there are too many words beginning with C, and the list would be very long as to when we learned this word. I'm going to quickly tell you if I can find it, as to which, we, which day we learned it. The word is cursory. I know we learned it, just give me one brief second here. I try to do it in a hurry. I can't find it. I'll tell you in the next video. I can't find it in a hurry. I'll tell you in the next video. Cursory is the word which means haste or hurry. And the adverb that I used was cursory. And then you take the uh, Y and replace it with I-L-Y. Cursory, I-L-Y, and it becomes adverb. It becomes adverb. Cursorily, which means hurriedly, quickly, in rush. How did I read the problem? I read the problem hastily. There you go, that's what it means. It means, cursory means haste, hurry. How did I read the problem? I read the problem hurriedly, hastily, cursorily. One mustn't do that. Do you understand? One mustn't do that. Unless, of course, one is hoping to do a banged up job. Then that's the way to go. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? We'll pick up from number 31 in a second column. Bye now.